it's a real pleasure to um, to have this opportunity to chat with you uh, today and to talk about the uh, C, the supportive environment fostering effectiveness framework or model, and um, to to um, remind some of you about some of this and to uh, have the opportunity for me to explore these ideas a little bit deeper and uh, push my own understanding. Um, so let me get started. The, the, the supportive environments uh, fostering effectiveness model is um, something that some of you are familiar with. It's a it's a framework for understanding how we might bring out the best in ourselves uh, or, or in others. It recognizes that people have fundamental needs for information from their environment. It recognizes that, uh, that these needs, that, that people, <laughs> people depend uh, for their effectiveness on a whole set of information needs. Uh, these that and these needs come from real places like cities or workspaces, uh, but also from social, social or virtual settings like, like the ones we're in right now. Uh, the C model suggests that when these environments support our information needs, people feel less overwhelmed and more motivated. I'm going to focus uh, on a portion of the framework today, uh, being capable. And um, I'm going to focus uh, that portion on um, this notion of having a clear head, uh, on attention to restoration theory, and some give, give some ideas about um, how we might recover from mental fatigue so that we can, in fact, be more capable. So we've all experienced times when we felt too mentally fatigued to tackle what has to be done. It, it's Friday afternoon, <laughs> maybe, maybe a lot of us feel that way right now. But despite this mental fatigue, we can be eager to go for a run or, or settle down with a good book or, or work in the garden, which begs the question, what, what is it that fatigues with mental fatigue? So this afternoon, uh, I wanna focus my answer on that. And uh, the, the, the big answer is that, that what fatigues is our capacity to pay attention, what, what psychologists would call uh, our top-down attention. My, my comments here in these few minutes are going to focus on the two kinds of attention that we have, why attention, uh, paying attention or top-down attention is so critical to our effectiveness. And oop, I'm not going to give you an empirical study. I'm going to give you some suggestions for what, what we might do. So when we talk about attention, we have to start with Stephen and Rachel Kaplan from the University of Michigan, who are this, Rachel's right here, and, uh, and their attention restoration theory. Attention restoration theory recognizes that we have two modes of attending to the world. I bet you can imagine what it's like for this woman, the woman above here, to, uh, to be testifying before this council. Her focus and her attention would certainly be different from if she were in natural spaces like these. Let, let's just go back again. What's it like? Think about what it's like for her and her focus here versus when she's here. Let's break this down a bit. Attention restoration theory recognizes that we have two modes of attending in the world. The first mode is called top-down attention or paying attention. Top-down attention is is perhaps the most important and useful resource that humans possess. Is what many people refer to when they speak of concentrating or, or paying attention or focusing their attention. The second type of attention is called bottom-up attention. So we have top-down and bottom-up. Bottom-up attention is triggered by stimuli in the world. Things like the sunset that are hard not to look at or a compelling story or or maybe hearing your name mentioned in a nearby conversation when despite your, your best intentions, your attention is drawn away from what you're focusing on uh, to, the, to the discussion where you heard your name. We can also look at these two kinds of attention with respect to how much effort they take. Top-down attention, paying attention takes effort. For me and for most of us, paying attention to any cognitively demanding task like editing, for instance, takes a lot of effort. Bottom-up attention, on the other hand, takes no effort. It doesn't take any attentional effort to look at a campfire 
or gaze at a waterfall or stare at a baby. And one of the great insights of attention restoration theory is that it argues that even everyday forms of nature, even nature in cities draws upon bottom up attention. I'll talk about why that's critical in just a second. We can also talk about why um, these two kinds of attention in terms of how much they're subject to fatigue. Top down attention or paying attention does fatigue. Top down attention fatigues after extended use, after a typical day in the modern world or by a Friday afternoon, certainly <laughs> our ability to focus our attention gets sluggish and it becomes harder and harder to stay focused. In contrast, bottom-up attention does not fatigue. You may get physically tired from walking in the woods or playing with puppies, but you won't get mentally fatigued from doing these things. Now, why, why does this matter? Why am I making a big deal out of top-down attention and bottom-up attention? There's two reasons why. First, when you use bottom-up attention, you give your top-down attention uh, a capacity to rest or time to rest and restore. The second reason is that our ability to pay attention or use our top-down attention is central to everything we care about accomplishing in life. It matters for learning and, and problem solving, planning and carrying out tasks, for monitoring ourselves and regulating our behavior and, and for effective social functioning. So let me just pause here and say, here's a short summary of my points so far. First is that we have two modes of attending in the world. Top-down is associated for, with everything that we care about accomplishing. Top-down attention is subject to fatigue and fatigues regularly. Using bottom-up attention helps restore our capacity to engage in top-down attention. When we exhaust our top-down attention, we pay a significant cost. The costs associated with this mental fatigue are substantial. What are some of these costs? Let, let's, take a, let's take a look at a few of them. One cost of mental fatigue is inattentiveness. Have you ever experienced this? Can, can you remember the time when you were listening to someone talk and all of a sudden you realized that you hadn't taken in anything over the past few seconds or minutes or, or minute or so uh, because you were deep in your own thoughts? When you're inattentive, you're likely to miss details and thus you're, you're more likely to make errors. Another cause of mental fatigue is that you're likely to be irritable. And when you're more irritable, you're not in a good state to learn or to solve problems or to get, engage in effective uh, social interactions. A third cost that I'll mention, the final cost I'll mention, is that when you're mentally fatigued, you're much more likely to be impulsive. That is, when you're mentally fatigued, you're more likely to do something that seems really attractive in the moment but may work against your long-term goals. So the key idea here, let's talk about it. Kaplan Kaplan proposed that because urban nature calls on the use of bottom-up attention, it provides people a chance to rest and restore their capacity for, to pay attention or to use top-down attention. They went on to predict that compared to more barren urban landscapes or urban or settings in general, greener ones, would allow us to recover from mentally, mental fatigue more quickly. Today, there is an enormous body of research in support of what I've just told you about attention restoration theory. This research comes from cancer patients and, and, and college students, medical personnel and school children, public housing residents and older people. Certainly, the demands on our top-down attention seem endless. Attention restoration theories suggest an array of possibilities for reducing mental fatigue and recovering from it. And that's what I'd like to talk about uh, in the next couple minutes here. Art uh, suggests, or attention restoration theories suggest um, that, or maybe it offers, a, it offers us uh, an invitation to engage in a series of uh, what Steve and Rachel call small experiments in which we explore how a modest change in what we're doing might um, impact our capacity to recover from mental fatigue. Let's look at a few possibilities. The first small experiment would encourage you to uh, become familiar 
with when you are mentally fatigued. Just recognize when you've become mentally fatigued. Well, the symptoms of mental fatigue are, are certainly similar to all of us. We generally have a hard time recognizing these symptoms as an outgrowth of having focused our attention too much or, or kind of driven our attention into the ground. Instead, we blame our reduced effectiveness on having a bad day or got up on the wrong side of the bed or having low blood sugar or being sick of whatever it is we're, we're focusing on at the moment. What if we learn to recognize and reflect on the symptoms of mental fatigue as a sign of an overuse top-down attention? Perhaps uh, you can make a habit to reflect on how you feel after a hard day or, or even a long week. Doing so seems like a very helpful first step. The second small experiment I want to suggest is this radical notion um, that you might take a break. Now I know, I know this runs counter to almost everything anyone who might be attending this discussion has been taught and practiced through their lives because you're the kind of hardworking folks uh, who attend uh, discussions like this. How often have, have you tried to power through your mental fatigue so you can finish the task at hand? Tom, is this familiar to you? Such heroic efforts yes. may seem laudable, but they make matters worse by creating errors or stimulating negative emotions such as irritability or anger or impatience or impulsiveness that can work against your long-term goals. Rather than a sign of weakness, taking a break may be the best thing that you can do in support of achieving your desired goals. So go for a short walk in a green space and see if that doesn't reduce your mental fatigue. Alternatively, think of a few minutes for meditation or mindfulness or enjoy a cup of tea uh, and see to what extent that restores your capacity to focus so you can dig back in at the hard work that you're working on. The third small experiment is to work to reduce distractions. Distractions draw on our limited top-down attention. We are all deluged with temptations of email and computer games and streaming videos, smartphones and podcasts and social media, all of which are competing to pull our attention away from the tasks at hand in favor of some kind of enticing little tidbit um, that uh, has very little to do with our goal or our purposes. These distractions can be incredibly costly. You might try turning off notifications on your phone or computer or using Apple's new focus feature, or take the bold step of uninstalling some distracting applications, or perhaps try recognizing the, the internal impulse you have to turn towards a distraction, and then pause. Take a couple of slow breaths and consider what you might want to do next. So this brings me to my final recommendation, and that is uh, to seek out nature. Perhaps you can arrange your workplace to permit a view of nature outside your window, or you can go for a walk in a nearby park, or instead of having a meeting in your office, you can have a walking meeting in a green space. Let me wrap up this portion by saying that the insights from attention restoration theory have wide ranging applicability. You can use these insights to create a calmer, more productive life, to bring forward your better self, improve your relationships and marshal the resources necessary to improve your effectiveness. All of us at Redirect wish you great success in doing just that. Thank you, Bill, for that presentation. Um, I can get us started with a first question. And I know we talked about this at some length in preparation for this webinar, but um, I was wondering if you, if you could talk a bit more about why having restored attention is so critical to fostering meaningful relationships with the people that we care about. I feel like uh, we often talk about um, attention restoration and it maybe more so immediately think about, you know, uh, its implications for productivity uh, or performance, but I think the, the meaningful relationship piece is a really important part that, that we can discuss a bit more. Yeah, th thank you for bringing that up. I, it's really, it's a, it's a wonderful question then. 
you're right we do especially i'm i'm guilty of focusing on the productivity side of the of the outcomes but the relationship part is um important and and really non-trivial the um when you think about the costs of mental fatigue that i mentioned a few minutes ago uh inattentiveness being error prone um being impulsive being irritable um, those are not a set of conditions that you'd like to be in on a regular basis when you're engaging with some of the most important people in your life. Now, uh, for me, it's, it's a given that I will be um, error prone when I'm mentally fatigued. I'm, I'm certainly <laughs> prone to missing details. And, um, and I'm I've noticed from my own small experiments that I'm prone to be irritable. And I, I and just recognizing that is very, just is incredibly helpful that, oh, I'm, I'm kind of fried right now and I'm uh, feeling a little irritable and I, I kind of understand why and that helps soften the blow. The, the research on this doesn't state that if you're mentally fatigued, it guarantees you're gonna be irritable or impulsive. It just says it, it tilts the playing field in the direction that you're, you're a little bit more likely to be that way. Um, I'm married to a person who can be just fried on a Friday night and th there's just no sign of irritability in her. Uh, she is not married to a person like that, unfortunately for her. And um, so these things are not guaranteed, but they, they kind of tilt the field in one direction or the other. So if you think about kind of bringing out your best in terms of the relationships with, the, with your loved ones or your friends or family members or, or your colleagues, people you're trying to do good works in the world with, um, having a, a restored attention will, will certainly mean you'll be more productive, but it will also very importantly mean you you be less impulsive. You'll be able to hang in there and listen a little bit longer before inserting your male answer syndrome or um, jumping to conclusions and thinking you understand what they're saying uh, without really having the having had the patience to listen carefully. Does that does that make sense, Paige? Yeah. Did, I wonder yeah, if anyone one else. Ha I wonder if anyone else has anything they want to add to that. Uh, so, Bill, you're making me uh, also remember that there's another way to think about this, right? Which is that navigating social relationships is also demanding, and that that can be a source of fatigue as well, right? So, and certainly some people have a uh, <laughs> we have a stronger reaction to them than other people. And one other piece for me is that. Uh, I think a lot of conflicts happen in social relationships because each of us is absorbed in our own individual stories and those stories often conflict. And when you're in nature, say, your own story dissipates to some degree and you're able to, you know, then communicate with others without being trapped in, in your own story. Definitely. And Along those lines, a follow-up question for Bill and maybe others here. What are some things that we can do when we maybe don't have nature immediately at our fingertips? We don't have um, a lush garden just outside of our home. How do, you, how do you go about restoring your attention and still having access to nature maybe if you, if you don't have access to some of those things? That's a really good question. Um, my go-to answer is always, you know, work with your neighbors to increase the amount of nature nearby. <laughs> but I think you're talking about a more immediate, uh, uh, a more immediate solution. And um, you know, there there are multiple um, there are multiple things that you can do, and there are multiple inclinations that we have. Some of which are probably not help helpful. So some of the things that you might do is. Um, and this is increasingly hard. You might choose to make a cup of tea and sit quietly for 10 minutes. That, that just sounds so romantic in this day and age, doesn't it? When 
um, in order to make a cup of tea and sit quietly in, uh, for 10 minutes, uh, uh, you have to do something else. Many of us would have to do something else. And that would be to ignore this distraction, which is um, so full of constant um, temptations to pull our attention away. Some of which may in fact be restored. So you could listen to some wonderful music, for instance. And that I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a great number of decades worth of music you could listen to that would be that would help restore your capacity to pay attention and put you in a better state to uh, have strong relationships. Um, on the flip side, you know, you could use this to read Reddit and just drive your attention into the ground, <laughs> or you could um, watch TV and um, kind of leave yourself feeling trashed in a different kind of fashion. Um, so my sense is um, it's hard. This is hard. This, what you're talking about is hard. Um, I think this is a really wonderful opportunity for small experiments to see what works for you to, um, to actually consciously make a decision. Oh, I, I'm feeling like this. I got this, I got seven minutes, I got 12 minutes. What can I do in that time? And, and then do a little, you know, a two second assessment of how you're doing and then try something and see how you're feeling later. I can tell you when I've done that and I've gone and read a political blog in the last three to five years, I don't necessarily feel better afterwards. Um, Understandable. <laughs> But, but if I listen to some music, for instance, or if I, if I do a, a short meditation or, or just sit calmly by myself, um, those things, I do feel significantly better. Yeah. What, what, what do other people do under those circumstances? Well, I was actually thinking about some of the points you made that were more, um, Kind of preventative, you know, the elim reducing mm. distraction. I sort of appreciate those kinds of ideas that are a little bit more like um, trying to sort of set your default so that you're not uh, end up as fatigued, not having to call on willpower so much to resist. And, um, you know, maybe just it's sort of like having policies for yourself. Maybe you leave your cell phone in the next room sometimes or. Uh, one of my colleagues has a computer that he doesn't have the internet, so it has no internet connection. He uses that for writing, you know, just another sort of small experiment idea. That's good. Yeah. Leaving the phone in another room is a great recommendation because that, that fun do not disturb setting can only do so much if you're still actively seeking out some stimuli from the phone. Uh, some, the absence of the prompt doesn't always do the trick I found for myself. Along these lines, um, and this is again, something that we've discussed a little bit at length, but what can we do when um, a lot of our modern society is built in such a way that is grabbing at our attention, I guess, what explains that default to still seek out those stimuli? Um, and Avik, feel, feel free to jump in as well. You know, Avik uh, had a really, we were, when we were talking the other day, Avik had a really lovely answer to this. I wonder if, Avik, would you feel comfortable sharing that answer now? I try or should to, I paraphrase it? <laughs> I can try to remember. I mean, I think the question, that I, I had asked was like, why is it so hard to restore ourselves? Like you would think that if we were uh, designed to need our attention, that restoration would sort of just happen. And in fact, we find ourselves often fatigued and not willing to engage in the activities that we know are gonna be helpful for us. Um, and so why is it so hard? And so, um, I don't know, and you can try to paraphrase, but I suspect that some of the reasons have to do with the fact that the environment that we evolved in is very different from the environment that we now live in. 
and the environment that we evolved in had much more opportunities for sitting and doing nothing. And uh, the modern environment always has things that ask for our attention, like our phones or screens or any, any number of things that are, things are happening all the time. I think I read a statistic once that the amount of information that we consume in a week uh, is the same amount of information that our ancestors, caveman ancestors, uh, consumed in their entire lifetimes. I mean, so, so that, but yet our brains still have the same sort of design that uh, the caveman ancestors had. So there's got to be a mismatch there. I think some psychologists call that a, an environmental mismatch. And so that could be one possible reason for why it is hard for us to seek out restoration in the face of uh, stimuli that are more exciting. Uh, so if I would, if I would say that in my own words, I would say, um, in the landscape of human evolution, our advantage was not our size or speed or strength, uh, but it was our capacity to process information. And those of us who were curious and wanted to learn more um, were probably more likely to pass on our genes over time. So we're we're in, we're a species at this point in which um, there's been a lot of reward for having um, or we've been selected, I guess, in some ways for people who are hungry for information and, and are inclined to learn more. And, um, and in the landscape of our evolution, um, there's no need to have an off switch <laughs> because you know, you, there, there just wasn't, uh, there wasn't Reddit or Instagram. Um, there wasn't a constant flow of um, YouTube designing algorithms to make it less, more and more and more and more difficult for you to click off and stop, um, stop paying attention. So the, um, I, I would say the enticements are, um, have been designed specifically for the ways in which our brains are configured and our inclination and our our inclinations towards information, and they've been they've been sharply sharply tuned, almost laser tuned, um, to uh, to capture our attention and hold it for as long as possible. And certainly, you know, companies like uh, Google and Facebook have made hundreds of billions of dollars over the years. Um, tuning our tuning their capacity to hold our attention to, to attract our attention and hold on to it so it really is a challenge in the world that we've built today if i may add to that oh sorry is that our attention is uh valuable extremely so because um people can change mind with it which move to political action they can um get you to spend money and um you know you can feel even feel better by having attention, right? So these values tend to make um, everyone and everything trying so hard to gain attention from someone, including us. And um, because of that, we if we just spend or pay attention to everything, then we're just gonna get fatigued. So yeah. yeah. And I, I just, I do want to draw attention to this question in the chat um, about successful examples of reducing fatigue with an audience. So reducing distractions is considered key, babysitting, meals, easy transport. But what about once your audience is there, what is well received? And Erica, you can uh, feel free to unmute and jump, jump in and expand on that. So are you talking about when you're like, let's imagine you're doing some kind of Friday afternoon webinar and people are kind of toast and you get a sense that you're losing people, you're losing their attention. What can you do? Is that, is that the question? Um, yeah, I think it applies in a lot of scenarios where you would have an audience. It might be a webinar, or it might be a workshop, or it might be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, we're trying to build a better uh, climate communication strategy at where I work. And 
Um, I'm trying to build it in such a way that the tools and the training that I offer people help them to recognize how the brain works when they are um, communicating that information, both how their own work, how theirs works, as well as how their audience works, which is of course you know the same, right? Because we're 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 largely working with humans. But um, one of the things that kind of comes up as a, a hard point for me to figure out how to express is, I mean, I've seen people do things like guided um, meditations or things like that with a group, but to, once you get the group there, once you've kind of gotten them to that space, whether it's a group in a webinar or a workshop or a one-on-one, -on -one, when you're talking about something like climate, something that's difficult and something that's gonna take a lot of channels in their brain, how do you first get them into a space yourself and I mean we can do that individually that that on ourselves but with someone you obviously don't know are there some some strong examples of out there the things that kind of work well for audiences ways they might be simple but just things that I can give us as tools to help our audience be in that right that space to take that information and because it is it is hard stuff and there's a lot of other stuff going on so well, the, the, you asked such an interesting and important question, and um, my my strong urge is to say uh, the answer is WWRD. What would Rachel do? And then I thought, oh, I could say that, but then I think, no, it's not quite what Rachel would do. It's more like what she would tell me to do. And she would tell me, and she would hit me upside the head, and she'd say, stop talking. And find opportunities for participation, engage people over the material, ask them to manipulate it or debate it or to turn it inside out or ask them to, um, well, yeah, to take the information and do something with it because if they do that, they're gonna build their own mental models about, um, about the information and they'll begin to own it and, and make it their own. And while they're doing that, um, they, they get a change of pace so that they're not listening to the person up front. That would be my suggestion. Rachel, what, what would you say? I said, what would Bill say? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's right. I think <clears throat> so much of it is a matter of engaging. I think another strategy sometimes is asking people how they would go about helping somebody else because people are very good at offering help that they wouldn't take for themselves. Hmm. Is that right? Strategy. Is that right, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I think so. I'm, I'm also... I mean, there's so many issues here that, Eric, I think you're bringing up, right? I mean, one is just like not fire hosing people with information, right? Which is probably very easy to do with the topics that you're dealing with. And I think you're also bringing up some interesting issues about, you know, the, the attentional demands that the uh, expert, the presenter presumes versus the experience for an audience, right? Those are very different kinds of things, right? If you're the presenter, I think you assume that a lot of, you make a lot of assumptions about what the audience knows and what they don't know and what's easy or hard. And those may not always be accurate. Uh, and I, I notice this in myself when I'm presenting information, there's also, I think this kind of gets to Bill's point, there's this um, inclination that you have to wanna fill all of the available space with talking and um, I can tell that when I can hold back on that and just leave those moments of silence for them to think about what's going on and have that space to process a little bit, I, I think that helps a lot. And it's really hard to make myself do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, but coming back to my previous point, Ra Rachel's often encouraged me or challenged me to try and do less. And she she rationalizes doing less because you look because she says I'll accomplish more, and I, and I found that that's been true. To if you if you can hold back and create the kind of space that Jason is talking about, um, people will actually it appears that people will actually leave 
owning more of whatever it is you wanted them to own because they've had more time to actually build the mental models that, um, that allow them to leave the venue and, um, and leave with the, with some portion of the knowledge or um, ideas that you, that you hoped that they would. So maybe try to do a little less. I can't resist. Think about posters, poster presentations in terms of doing less yes. and trying to communicate anything. I remember all of the posters I've ever seen. <laughs> You know, the, the, the idea of a poster is such a good idea, right? You go to a conference and you have a poster and then you can stand in front of it and then people walk by and ask you questions about it. It's just such a lovely idea. And then when you do it, you realize oftentimes you're doing it at the, and you're kind of fried from being at the conference and talking to all these people. And then you go up to a poster and it's got 4,000 words on it and diagrams that you can't read and you're, you're, going, you're going up really close to trying to see it. <laughs> And, and you do that for one or two and then you have to leave because you're so fried, you, you can't, it's just too much. So finding ways to boil it down, say less, um, seems like a, a really, really good advice. If I could uh, jump in with Erica's question, uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with Catherine Tejo, uh, who's an atmospheric scientist at Texas Tech University and an evangelical Christian and a mom and uh, she's given a TED talk and during uh, COP26, she gave a uh, presentation for the Oxford Climate Society, the people that have the 26,000 conversations, if you're not, if you're familiar with that. And one of the things that she emphasizes regarding climate is just the importance of talking with people that very, very, most people just don't talk about climate. And, but, but when she discovered as she gave lots of talks especially as a Canadian going down to Lubbock, Texas. Uh, she found that she was talking, just giving, giving the information, giving the facts. She figured she'd win, win over people, whether it's in academic settings or in uh, social groups. And uh, she had a lot to say about the social groups of Lubbock, Texas. But uh, one of the things um, she pointed out is that people didn't want her to tell her to just bombard them with information. And she started just listening to people and asking what questions they had, and then just trying to build uh, com on commonalities. And so that was that's her her big thesis is talk about climate and build on things that you that, that you find out what people are passionate about and build on that. And so uh, the folks at Yale uh, Climate Project uh, did a research involving her where they uh, did these four little videos uh, that talk, that focused on values that conservative Republicans hold dear, like uh, free market and uh, less government, less regulation and Christian values. And I forget what the fourth is. And she gave these presentations. And one of the things she found is that just by then presenting about climate, when she presented in, this, in these videos about climate, then all of a sudden they were a lot more receptive when they tagged into something like that that, that, they, that, that they adhere to, like, like less smaller government, less regulation, uh, and so forth. Uh, so I don't know, that's, that's just back to Erica's. Uh, I, I saw so many. Uh, presentations, uh, webinars, and so forth uh, during the whole COP26 process, and but that's one that uh, that I and that that I've just just thought resonated with some of what you've been talking about. I, I just want to jump in on Tom's comment. I think it's a great comment because what you're, I think, part of what you're getting at is taking advantage of natural fascination. Right, so it's easier to process. It's less demanding of attention because you're connecting with something that they already value, already care about, that they're already invested in. So the attentional effort is going to be lower, right? It's going to be easier to do. I think that's a great uh, example. I had a question for you, Bill. 
So back in the day, however many decades ago it was that I took uh, Stephen Kaplan's uh, seminar, 700 level seminar uh, in environmental psychology, uh, we read part of William James uh, Psychology, a briefer course, and where James talked about voluntary and involuntary attention. Are they, are they pretty much the same thing as what you're calling top down and bottom up? Yes, they're identical. Uh, okay. In terms of evolved, and I started using top down and bottom up because that's really what's being used in the psychological literature these days. And um, but but James initially framed, and he was I think he was the first to write about these two modes of attending, and and he called them top down, or he called them uh, voluntary and involuntary. And, and then so Steve Steve started calling them directed, direct and indirect attention so there's there's various terms so i thought it was interesting that you said that story storytelling telling and listening to stories is a bottom-up process i mean it probably depends a lot on the the nature of the story isn't it or it's, it's not uh i mean why, yeah. why, why do you, why would why would you consider it that way um well, I think a story that's got a powerful narrative that draws you along is, um, I think we're configured to, uh, to not spend a lot of effort attending, uh, or, or yeah, it doesn't, it draws on, uh, it, it often draws on fascination, uh, which is a part of bottom up attention. And, um, but you know, lots of these things are not this bin or that bin, there's a kind of a continuum. Um, so if I had a story that I was telling my students and I wanted them to have certain facts or uh, ideas that they would leave with it, they're probably engaging, they're, they're somewhere along the continuum from, from bottom up to top down. Uh, but many of the stories that, um, that are used to engage our attention uh, are, are really just fascinating interesting like mysteries or where you where you mystery stories where you we have a a, a a challenge or um some unexplained event and then you follow along the story uh in an effort to solve the problem or or, or un, unveil the the whodunit um these are not necessarily mentally fatiguing uh stories that i'm, I'm sure that uh, others have some insights on this Maybe Martha does. Both stories have a character, and the character is often written in a way that you can identify with that person. So you're rooting for the character as they go through challenge after challenge, and finally, success happens, which is generally the, the, the pattern of what makes a story a story. There's a, a challenge, something to be done. There's attempt one. Oops, didn't quite work. Attempt two, oh no, try this instead. Attempt three, yay, finally we did it. So I think that's what Bill means in terms of a story. I know, Bill, when we were prepping for the webinar, you had talked about um, that being one of your own small experiments that you try to engage in when you're you know, restoring attention or you have a break, you sort of lean into listening to podcasts. And I often find myself doing the same thing. And it's not necessarily on par with sitting still and with a cup of tea, but I, I feel like it gets me a step closer to having um, that attentional capacity to get back into work once I'm, once I'm done taking that break. Yeah, I think it depends on the podcast, right? Definitely, yes. <laughs> um, so can I have the last uh, little absolutely. summary here? No. Yeah. So here's my little summary. Um, our capacity to attend is vital. It's fragile. We regularly drive it into the ground. When we drive it into the ground, there's a bunch of negative consequences in terms of our functioning and our relationships. Uh, and there's a, but there's a magic in engaging in small experiments and those small experiments can help you figure out what works best for you. So we just encourage you to, um, 
to pay attention to how you're doing and to, to kind of note when your attentional uh, functioning seems to be on the decline or you're getting exhausted or tired. Uh, pay attention to the consequences and, and, then, and then make some small tweaks. Maybe get another half an hour of sleep. Maybe go for a walk a little earlier or take a meeting uh, outside or go for a bike ride um, and, and see what happens. 